Uh, welcome to this workshop. My name is Louise Mistel and I'm the Executive Director at Sky Island Alliance and we're thrilled to have so many of you with us today to learn about how to submit comments on this important um, remediation plan that's out right now. So um, uh, thank you to everyone who uh, joins us as a volunteer and supporter in making this work possible. All of you are so important to uh, Sky Island Alliance and making this kind of work possible. I want to take a moment to uh, recognize that the Sky Island Alliance office here in Tucson is on the land of the Tana Odom, Pascoyaki, and other indigenous peoples. Our work throughout the Sky Island region on both sides of the US-Mexico border takes place on indigenous lands. And at Sky Island Alliance, we acknowledge the lack of truth and reconciliation with Native nations. Um, I think this is particularly important with this issue as we've seen the border um, create a lot of violence against indigenous people um, and their voices not being respected. So we are committed to continuing to educate ourselves about the process um, and mobilizing to stand in solidarity with present day tribes and support indigenous people who are acting to restore their rights and protect the land we all call home. And we invite you to join us um, and visit our website for more resources. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Emily Burns, Program Director at Sky Island Alliance. And we're thrilled to also have Miles Traphagen from Wildlands Network with us here today. Take us away, Emily. <laughs> well, thank you, Louise. And thank you to uh, Miles for sure for being here today. Uh, Miles and I have been really pouring ourselves into what this Tucson sector uh, CBP remediation plan is all about. And we've had some pretty interesting discoveries as we've worked through it. And we wanna share what we figured out with all of you. So thank you for being here. The purpose of our time together in this workshop is really to understand what is actually included in the Customs and Border Protection Remediation Plan and what is not included. This is really relevant for us because this plan is not restoration of our borderlands. It's not tearing down the wall. So it has a bunch of other things that are included in it and I'm gonna walk through what's in it and what's not in there. We're gonna go over what um, our recommendations are for improving wildlife connectivity across the border in the context of the presented remediation plan. So that's our primary focus today. We have many, many interests that we wanna see happen along the border and I'm guessing all of you do too. You may have your own particular places, things you really care about. We invite you to include that in your comments to CBP, but please understand today we are really focusing on some strategic recommendations that we think if we bring our voices together and focus on a few pl key places and a, key a few key actions, we can hopefully affect some change. We're also going to discuss um, the actual language, the key terms to include in your comments and how to physically get them um, to customs and border protection. There are a few different pathways for that. And so this is a little bit complicated. Um, I'm, I won't wanna sugarcoat it for you. It's been complicated to understand the plan, to review it all. And it is gonna be complex information to digest into your comments. So Miles and I are gonna do our best um, and we're gonna walk you through what resources you need to have at hand in order to create your comment letter or to enter feedback directly into the CBP map portal. Okay, so what is this plan? Um, the plan is really a list of locations where very simple un basically undescribed remediation activities are proposed. And there are a variety of different remediation activities that have been listed in this plan. Um, cattle guard replacements, culvert installation, reseeding seems to be a, a common theme for different types of disturbed area along the border wall area. Um, the installation and repair of gates, that is one issue we are in particular gonna focus on today. Um, improving drainage at low water crossings, filling retention ponds. And then the other things that are in the plan in some capacity, and we're gonna fo focus on them today, are repairing and decommissioning new roads that were put in during construction, 
We're going to comment on the proposed installation of small wildlife openings. And then what's listed in the plan as other and not described, we are also going to be talking about gaps in the wall and where they plan to close them and where we most the most important gaps we want to see left open. <clears throat> okay, so what is this plan not? <laughs> I want to make it very clear that the border barrier remediation plan is not part of a NEPA process. Typically, any federal action that has a significant impact on the environment would be subject to a very thorough uh, environmental review. This is not what this comment part this comment process is part of. We are not reviewing any kind of a NEPA document, okay? So that's just important to know because you may be thinking, oh, well, there should be this and there should be that and this detail should be available. This is not a NEPA process. So unfortunately, what we have is just the limited information that was put in the remediation plan. One of the big um, important things to understand is that this plan does not include any wall removal. So this is not um, restoration of the borderlands where actually segments of wall would be taken down. There's nothing in the plan that, that speaks to that. The plan does not reveal where seg segments of wall gaps are gonna be closed. Um, in When Secretary Mayorkas in December of last year talked about the need for remediation at the border, he made it clear at that point uh, that there would be gaps that would get, get filled. And of course, this really rang a lot of alarm bells because, well, what's a gap? <laughs> what counts as a gap? And how do we know where they are and which ones are most threatened by this? Um, I do just want to say that we're going to be talking very explicitly about where the gaps are and the ones we think are at high risk of being closed. We do have it from verbal communication from the Department of Homeland Security that the gaps will be between to, uh, 20 and 100 feet in size, the ones that are subject to closure. So we're not talking about multi-mile stretches where that are continue to be unwalled today. We have to take them on their word for that, um, but I do think that's hopeful that big stretches like across the San Rafael Valley and even over the Huachuca Mountains between wall segments, that they are likely not at risk with this particular remediation plan. The plan does not reveal where blasting damage occurred during construction. There are a lot of missing photographs um, and the documentation about what actually happened in certain parts of the, the border is very absent. And it does not provide wildlife crossing mitigation at major water courses. So there's very minimal um, mitigation in the plan around wildlife crossings. And lastly, it also does not uh, address stadium lighting across the wall. And we're gonna talk about um, some simple asks that we can make in our, our comments about that as well. Okay, now, in order to make this as hopefully simple as possible for everyone, we have three resources that we hope you'll take advantage of. The first one was emailed out to you this morning if you had previously registered for this presentation. Um, this is a PDF that is our our talking points on and the comment talking points. You can access this PDF on our website, skyislandalliance.org slash act dash now. You'll be able to find this. We're gonna be walking through these talking points and you're definitely gonna want these details when it's time to do your commenting. The next two pieces, one is an official um, custom and border patrol product. Um, that's their plan story map. And the other one is a separate map developed by Miles um, that is the one that's actually gonna show you what's going on along the border. And we've embedded our comments in particular locations within that. So links to both of these are also available on that Act Now page. We are going to transition now into comparing these two maps, the tale of two maps. <laughs> um, and if you get confused on which map is which, the alternative map, the conservation map, is the one that has the, the little images of the deer, okay? That's the wildlife friendly one. <laughs> so from here, I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it over to Miles to walk us through these maps. Thank you, Emily, and thank you, Louise and Sky Island Alliance and everybody who's attending here. Um, yeah, what uh, really comes out when you first read this document 
um, is that it's it's basically protection of the border security infrastructure resource. Um, they may say environmental remediation, but the reality is that they're trying to prevent the erosion of, of the road so that they can still use patrol roads so that they can um, so that the border wall you know stays up that it doesn't fall over. Um, but there, there's very little that addresses the impacts to wildlife or the impacts to um, free flowing rivers and streams uh, that are going to be dammed up and have been dammed up. So um, just keeping that in mind, that uh, it's not really a very uh, effective document for the purposes of what I, I believe most everybody attending this webinar is, is really interested in. So at this point, um, I'll share my screen here, and I'm going to go over the two maps that uh, we were discussing. So hopefully everything is, you can see that. You can see the That's CBDP good. map. Great. Okay, so this is from the document that they released to ask for public comment. And they did this in a story map format, which is, um, that's kind of novel for them. Um, but, um, and you can enter comments uh, in locations on the map, and I'll show you how to do that. Um, but there's also the email address here, and this is probably gonna be the most effective place to enter your, your comments because you can put together an entire document. You could submit photos. Um, tables, maps, you know, whatever it is, you can submit that in greater detail uh, by just going straight to the email address. Um, here is the, the overall map. Now, um, I'm going to describe this in some detail because maybe uh, people have not had experience working with these online story maps. So we're looking at Arizona. Uh, Biles, before you yeah. get going, can you make the map as big as possible on your screen? Yeah, I'll do that. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So here we have Arizona. There's San Luis Rio, Colorado, and Yuma over here. And then there's the New Mexico state line. So this document is specifically addressing the Tucson sector uh, and, and not New Mexico and California and Texas. Uh, but we've been told in meetings that those are forthcoming. So we can expect to see this, uh, the next iteration come down the pipe fairly soon. So they've color coded. Um, all of these properties here by land managers. And what you need to do is actually go down to the legend and open it. Um, it's sort of one of these flaws, I think, in the ArcGIS story map is that by default, it always has the legend minimized. So uh, this is important so you know uh, who the land ownership uh, agency is and also some of the, the features that they're describing uh, on this. So we'll start from west to east and uh, show you what uh, is going on here. So this is Cabeza Prieta National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, notice that the Barry Goldwater Range is conspicuously absent and there's a lot of severe damage at the Tinajas Altas area. So um, that's one of these places that thinking outside the box, is, is at least outside of the box that they're trying to feed us from, um, we need to bring things back into reality here. So. In this area, they basically are addressing culverts or low water crossings. So what you do is you click on one of these little icons and then you read what they did for their field collection. So on June 23rd, they went and identified this as a low water crossing. And then they have taken some pictures in certain locations to give you an idea of, of what that might look like. Um, then it says, do you have restoration recommendations or comments? Submit them here. So you click on that little link there and then you can write in your comment. And um, this is where it gets a little bit complex, but each place has its own reference ID for the comment. So this 4Z79 blah, blah, blah would um, uh, pertain to this particular location. Um, I don't see that as, as having a lot of utility for what we're trying to do because um, it's it's hard to argue against um, you know you know cattle guards um, low water crossings um, erosion control um, you know these are things that should be done with best practices anyway so um, for uh, the general public to provide comments on things that are more of engineering nature. Um, you know, that's rather dubious. But you can see they, they went through this in, in quite 
uh, painstaking detail when they surveyed to look at all the low water crossings, to look at the culverts. Um, they have photos of these. Um, so, uh, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you our map here and how this contrasts. So this is made in Google My Maps. And the decision to do this was because it requires no special software. It's all just a web-based web -based map and anybody can use this in the world and you don't have to have any special skills. So I'll start out here with showing that the, the red line here is obviously a pedestrian border wall, or at least you know the red kind of alerts you to that. If you click on that, um, you'll get little pop-up boxes with more detail than you probably would want, but it is helpful to, to know, uh, you know more detail if you're making comments, such as uh, that this was a, a certain project. This was a Yuma project three and four uh, pedestrian fencing. So you can get all the segments and the, the lengths there. Um, Miles, but, we're having another request about enlarging. Would it be possible for your browser window to be larger on your desktop, maybe? How's that? That looks better. Thank you. And um, so you'll be able to, to interact with this on your own, um, on your own computer. And the link for that is in the... Uh, or the the plan that CB or that Sky Island sent out um, for the invitation for this, so you'll see that map embedded in there, and you can click on that. So what what we've done here is in the Tinajas Altas Mountains. This is in uh, the Barry Goldwater Range, uh, actually on the the Marine Corps side. Is we embedded our own photos of what's happened here because this is what they have not told us. So this is a wildlife crossing. This is um, a gap that they are talking about closing, although they have not identified any of the gaps. But this is an example of one of what one of these might look like. So in the map, there's several pictures embedded. In this case, it's a primary border wall and a secondary wall um, of a huge distance, about 300 meters between that. But you can see that uh, in the Tinajas Altas Mountains here, there's a place for bighorn sheep to cross the border and and go from one side to the other. Um, this is where the wall ends. And this is what it looks like generally around that area. So, um, you know, go through this and click on these, these, these photos and, and links. So you'll get a, a better idea of, of what, what truly happened out here, because this is the information that they're not showing us. Um, the, the info that, that they've presented uh, is like, this is generally the same area. Um, they just put low water crossing. Let's see if they have a, a photo here. Nope, there's no photo. Um, there's, there's, if they do provide a photo, you know, it's showing the, the border wall infrastructure, but not necessarily the, the land and what happened to it. So let's move a little bit further east with the CBP map. And uh, we'll go straight to um, uh, Buenos Aires National Wildlife Refuge. Um, now, here is Sasabe. Um, they have some information that, you know, disturbed area needs to be revegetated. Okay, that's, that's fine. Um, and then they have what you think might be the wildlife crossing thing, but it's actually a cattle guard that they need to, to protect that cattle guard. And in fact, they even have a picture of, of that, but that's not even a cattle guard right there. Um, but what they're, what they're not showing is, is, is uh, you know, this. Sorry, there's no way around um, kind of the, the messiness of this unless we did it in a PowerPoint, but um, we really wanted to get the point across that uh, using the interactive map is, is more effective. Um, this is on the refuge uh, about three miles west of or east of Sasabe. So this is one of the gaps and a big part of CBP's proposal for comments uh, has been 
to do something about these gaps and fill these in, yet they have not provided the public with information on one, where the gaps are, and two, what does a gap mean? And as Emily said earlier in meetings with DHS, they've said that they're interested in closing the small ones, 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet, maybe 100. But this is at points where the wall was coming together. And as you can see here, um, we're at a, a drainage, a wash here. And there's a distance of about uh, maybe two or 300 feet. Uh, this is the largest gap, by the way. And so these are where they're proposing to fill these in. Um, this is a very active desert wash, and there's a good reason why they weren't able to fill it in. And um, right after the monsoon this year, there was substantial damage, which now they've put a lot more rock in there to um, in concrete in order to try to prevent more erosion. Um, here's an, another example of a gap. This one's slightly smaller, probably about 30, 40 feet wide. But in this, you'll see a description that says, do not close gap in the wall across drainage in Buenos Aires. Um, feel free to use these locations and examples. Uh, all the pictures and everything is public here. You'll see there's a latitude and longitude right there. You can copy that. Uh, provide that in your comments. Be very site specific about uh, where we're talking here. Uh, that's very important detail to provide them. And uh, the regulators or people um, documenting the comments will probably be putting this in spreadsheets or tables. And um, if we have enough location information there, uh, perhaps they'll start paying attention to this. Miles, if I could just add, um, in the title for some of the key locations where we are asking people to focus comments, the comment number in this particular case, Buenos Aires NWR, comment A4. Comment A4 refers to the talking points document and you can go down and find additional detail and you can grab um, the caption, if you will, or the specific comment sentence directly from that PDF document. Good deal. Could you show us the um, where those longitude lines up? The longitude is again. Right in the lower left corner, you'll see this thirty-one point four six, right there. Do you see that? It'd be right, right there where I'm highlighting. So you can just do a direct copy of that. Um, the photos are also geotagged and, um, and I'm going to provide a link that goes directly to the photos folder that has a lot more examples of this. Um, there's still a few photos that need to be added to this map here. Um, the import didn't go smoothly and it, uh, they got dislodged. So I need to just do a little bit of GIS work in the background, but that should be up by the end of the day. Um, but you're getting the idea that there's, um, uh, some, let me get an example of a, a place where they really severely blasted. Okay, so these are one of these situations where they talk about patrol roads. Now, they're most likely not going to turn this into a road. It would be impossible to do that at this point. Um, but this is an example of what they have not shown us, that in their document and their map, there's, there's nowhere in that uh, that they show the damage that occurred. Uh, in fact, there's, there's, there's nothing. This is, this is where that hill is. It's called Cerro del Fresnal. And that was blasted away because um, they were trying to create a border wall right along the line. Instead of taking the existing road and going about 300 meters behind it, um, they, were, they blasted through the mountain. You'll see that they're not being forthcoming with the damage that was done. And, and uh, a place like Cerro del Fresnal is an, an extreme example of um, major blasting damage uh, that needs serious high dollar restoration. Um, the scars are going to be there forever. There's no putting this back together the way it was but uh, we can at least try our best. But these are the type of things that CBP has not been forthcoming about in their document. So as you explore this map, if you come across something like that, you may be able to cross-reference and realize, wow, they're not proposing any remediation actions at all. And if it really speaks to you, you could provide a comment, like as Miles is saying, decommission the road, and, you know, begin and make suggestions about what you'd like to see there. <clears throat> 
right here, we're, this is Nogales. So the Santa Cruz River enters from Sonora, comes up from the south. Um, you'll see that there's nothing here uh, addressing what is going to happen there. But there's a, a lot that, that, that needs to be addressed there, such as, um, uh, you know, here's the bridge. And that is an open gap of about a quarter mile. Are they going to fill that in or are they going to um, leave this as a free flowing river and a place for wildlife to migrate? So you'll see a pattern here is that they're not putting forth, you know, the real damage and the real problems here. And so therefore it's up to us, the public, uh, to call them out on it and say that, you know, you didn't address any of these issues and these are the critical um, corridors for wildlife movement and for hydrologic movement. And we wanna see this addressed. Uh, here's another example. Um, this is the Patagonia Mountains. This photo was taken January 19th of 2021. So that was the day before the inauguration and they were going as fast as they could to make it up from the, the Santa Cruz River over the top of the Patagonia Mountains. Keep in mind, this is um, jaguar critical habitat. So you'll see here's uh, in the comment, this is comment D1, refer to the, the PDF document that Emily was describing. And here's what we're asking, decommission the patrol road extension, terminate the border road, border road at the end of wall. Um, the, these are, are places that they have not done anything about. See, you see here, this is Kino Springs, here's the river. They have not said anything about what's happened here, except uh, I do see a little gray thing there. Um, disturbed areas outside the Roosevelt Reservation. So they, they show the road, and this is, um, seems to be a popular theme, is that they, they kind of just give you a little bit of smidgen of, of maybe what it looks like, but um, they're not really you know, showing the magnitude of it. In fact, they've repeated the same photographs there. So this is, um, our, our map here is a guide to what's actually happened on the ground. And that's, um, it's sort of a truth check. You may be noticing this white line flashing there. Let me zoom out here. Um, these blue shaded areas are jaguar critical habitat. So this would be the Patagonia unit. This would be the Atascosa unit over here. So um, we wanted to just put that there as a layer so that if people wanted to address an issue, they would know if it occurred in jaguar critical habitat. Um, oh, and while we're here on this, there's, uh, you can choose your base maps. So um, you can choose this and it'll give you an idea of the, the political boundaries, uh, reserve areas, uh, forest service properties. So um, don't be afraid to toggle between all of this. It's all, you know, whatever suits your, you know, preference. Um, this adds a little bit more topography to it. So just, just keep in mind that, that you have a lot of options on the interactive map to um, interact with this, as well as uh, the legend on the side, is you can actually turn these layers off and on, um, such as here's the vehicle fence. You click that um, and it will turn off this layer. This is the San Rafael Valley, Coronado National Memorial off here to the east. Here's Nogales to the west. So if you wanna see you know, what the state of the, the vehicle barrier is versus the pedestrian one, you can do that. As you can with all of these other locations that we've been talking about. Um, it's, there's really no way around just getting in there, mess around with the map. You can't break anything with it. So don't be afraid to, click to your heart's desire. Everything will be just, just fine. Um, and we've added as many items here as we thought were relevant to this exercise, such as here's the waters and rivers uh, that we would like to see addressed, such as Silver Creek, Santa Cruz River, San Pedro, Hay Hollow, et cetera. We'll move over here quickly. Uh, here is the, the San Pedro uh, River. That's the San Pedro Riparian Natural Conservation area managed by the BLM. Um, the CBP map uh, does not really address things from a perspective of, you know, let's 
keep the gates open so that we can have water movement and, um, and wildlife movement. Uh, instead, they, they just show the infrastructure and they don't really say very much about what they want to do with that, um, with the exception of uh, protecting the patrol road and protecting the border wall. So that's the impetus for this alternative map that we've made is that this is the same exact area, but what we've done is we've, we've placed photos of what the uh, border wall looks like and how the gates are closed and what it would be like if these were open and we had free flowing water. So uh, I think that the term alternative map is appropriate. Um, to close up here, let's go over to the San Bernardino Valley. This is, um, this is a, a place uh, called Silver Creek, and this uh, saw a significant flood event, and that was um, you know, in the news. Actually, that's not Silver Creek there. It's close to it. Um, there we go. That's a drone photo taken just a few days after this flooded. Um, this is the place where the, the floodgates were ripped off their hinges after the only significant flood event that occurred there this year. And um, we have not had any of the big events like from the Chubascos, the hurricanes that come out of Baja in September and October that tend to dump four and five inches of rain in, in one event. Um, those have not happened in the last couple of years since they built this border wall. But this is, this is showing on the ground, you know, what, this, what it looks like and what has happened. And um, our ask, keep floodgates open at Silver Creek year round. And this is in our comment section of, of B2 on the document. Uh, let's see, did CBP address this? I, I'm guessing that they, they probably did not say anything about it. Um, Okay, this is the San Bernardino Refuge, so we're, we're close to it. Let's see if they showed their Silver Creek here. I don't think so. It says, oh, this is a, a low water crossing. Um, but that's not even the low water crossing, that's a staging area there. So, you know, the quality control for this um, was really lacking for their product. They're, they're not really getting that the core of the issue here. They're just generally saying this is a disturbed area outside the Roosevelt Reservation and we need to fix it. But this is Silver Creek right here. And there's no, there are no photos showing, you know, what happened at Silver Creek. You don't get to see any of this. Um, CBP is not addressing water flow, nor are they addressing wildlife migration. So you can go all along this and find, you know, many locations like this is Black Draw, uh, where they built the 30 foot border wall. This is what it looks like when it was closed. Um, there's hundreds of gates all along the border. Um, so if they want to create wildlife migration routes, they could just simply open those. And the last thing I want to show here is Guadalupe Canyon. Um, let's, let's just do like we've been doing, testing this and seeing, what did they say about Guadalupe? Okay, this legend item here says Rockfall. So let's click on their thing at Guadalupe and see, okay, let's see the Rockfall. Okay, well, I see a few rocks there, but it doesn't really tell the, the true picture of what's going on there. This is what they did, is that they blasted away in the Guadalupe Canyon Outstanding Natural Area, Area Critical Environmental Concern, and Wilderness Study Area. It has all those designations. And they built this patrol road. And of course, as the contractors have done, they stick a little orphan wall up there in hopes that you know, they can maybe continue that. Um, who knows? But this is where we um, have, have placed pictures that, that actually show what happened on the ground, as well as our ask. Terminate the patrol road that enters the Guadalupe Canyon. Um, keep in mind that just uh, back in March, about two miles, just right over here is where um, National Geographic researcher Ganesh Marin had photographed or videoed the jaguar. So we're right in jaguar critical habitat here, and the jaguars seem to be using it because they're, they're right there. 
This is the, the patrol road and the big notch that they blasted through the mountain. Um, you're not gonna see that on any of the CBP maps. Um, this is Rockfall because they blasted away here. That's a 30 foot wall going right through the Guadalupe Canyon uh, Ranch. In fact, this is all, that all fell on private property. So again, here's our ask there, terminate the patrol road, et cetera. Um, so that's, that's generally all I have here. Oh, one small thing I will point out here while we're on the, the topic of, um, of wildlife crossings is here are the, there it is. That, that's the right down here in the lower left corner, install and maintain small wildlife openings. Each one of these bollards is six inches wide. This opening doesn't even cut away one bollard. They are eight and a half by 11 inches in size. I, I went to PetSmart the other day and these are actually smaller than the doggy door you can get at your local pet store. So it's pretty uh, pathetic solution and um, it's quite insulting because um, nothing larger than a squirrel or a cottontail is gonna go through that. And our species of concern happen to be Sonoran pronghorn, uh, peninsular desert bighorn sheep, Mexican gray wolf, jaguar, ocelot, and all the common everyday species that we all see when we are in the borderlands, like mule deer, white-tailed deer, bobcats, turkey, you know, all of these animals, javelina, they're not gonna be able to make it through here. Um, so this is what we need to point out is that these small wildlife openings are really a joke uh, if it wasn't so tragic. And so the best thing that they could do would be to actually leave the gaps that they wanna fill in as gaps. Um, most people who are out working along the border rarely see anybody coming through these things um, from a, a tactical perspective. Um, it doesn't really make much sense for them to put all this effort into filling these in because the gaps have been there a long time and they are extremely important for the wildlife. So we really need to push back on the fact that eight and a half by 11 inch wildlife passage is somehow sufficient to mitigate the impacts of the border wall. And I'll stop there and uh, we can take many questions. I'm sure people will have a lot of questions regarding this. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of dialogue in the chat and we'll get back to that. I think before we open it up to just a bunch of questions that are coming in, I do want to um, briefly walk through the talking points document and orient you a little bit more to what is there. Um, so as, as Miles has shown, there is a lot you can get out of looking at the two maps to help educate yourself about what's been going on in different parts of the border, this 119 mile stretch, and to actually find locations that you want to incorporate into your comments. Um, but overall, it, even stepping away from the map, what we're focusing on here um, are major themes around the wildlife crossings and the gaps in the wall and the patrol road extensions. So in this document, you'll have the information that you need in order to submit your comments. If you're emailing, I guess you could call it in. <laughs> I'd have trouble describing it over the phone, but that is an option. Um, or as Miles showed, you can click on the CBP story map on a particular point and enter in a comment. That will be anonymous unless you add your name. So I would recommend if you do uh, want to identify yourself, you just have to add your name at the end of your comment in those particular uh, boxes. Some general thoughts about how to make your comments count. We think that the alternative Google map can help you um, either find photographs or particular languages, even the, G, uh, the lat latitude and longitude coordinates to make your comments more specific. So please use anything that we have on that map at your disposal. Um, we do recommend whenever possible using your own words uh, to make it personal from you and to differentiate your comments from others. The more comments they feel are different but on the same theme are gonna carry the most weight. So it's differentiating but keeping them similar enough. So we are saying use keywords, key phrases, key locations. And if they see a lot of comments on the same places, the Santa Cruz River, um, Guadalupe Canyon, hopefully these comments will get group together in the correct buckets. Skipping past um, what this 
section on understanding the remediation plan, we can scroll down to the key messages for comments letters. We haven't walked through all of this in our commentary around the maps, um, but we do have some statements around gaps in the wall, keeping these gates open that are already going across our major water courses. Those are the San Pedro, Silver Creek, Black Draw, Hay Hollow. And then we're asking them to expand the size of the wildlife openings that they say they will put in. So we're asking for the creation of large wildlife openings and we have some information about a minimum size requirement that would be necessary for these openings to be effective for the type of large mammals that like pronghorn and black bear that Miles described. Um, decommissioning patrol road extensions. You will see on the CBP map some places, especially where there were new switchbacks that were put up in higher elevation areas. They say that they will consider decommissioning uh, in collaboration with the public land managers. We hope that that's the case. And we have places where we are asking specifically um, to close those roads as they not only pose a security risk, allowing vehicles to go into previously inaccessible areas, um, but they're eroding habitat as well. Around the disturbed habitat, um, Erosion control, revegetation, and with invasive species monitoring are all really important aspects of this. We want all of this work to be done in consultation with the public land managers. Um, we would like erosion control to happen first and then revegetation, not just with seeding. Everything refers to seeding. We think it's warranted to actually invest in native plants as well. Um, and all of these construction sites are identified as highly prone to invasion by nox noxious weeds. So they are postponing invasive weed management until they get to restoration in a later phase. It's not really included in this remediation plan, but we think that that's definitely a mistake. And then we're asking for turning off all lighting infrastructure. Um, additional things that may be worth noting in your letters, we think they are, we can't hurt to say we want NEPA, we want the National Environmental Protection Act and other environmental laws and statutes to be applied at the wall. Um, we sincerely hope that they're going to be listening to the federal, other federal agencies. Um, we know that National Park Service staff and units are providing feedback to CBP also in this remediation plan. We want those voices to be heard already mentioned the invasive species management. And then other best practices that you may want to highlight would be maybe they shouldn't be doing construction in the spring and summer when we have a lot of migratory species on the move. So you could think about the particular implementation of the actions they're proposing and what concerns arise. Okay, and finally, this additional location information. This is outlined with numbers. So A1, you will find on the alternative map, the Google map, you'll be able to find the particular location where we do not want the gap to be closed in the wall across the Santa Cruz River. So you don't necessarily need the map if you just want to articulate that phrase using this, these comments, but to help you know where on the map that is, um, you can look for um, the point A1, for example. So this lists just the very tip of the iceberg. I mean, there are so many other places where we don't want gaps to be <laughs> closed. You can see other gaps on the Google map, um, but here's a suggestion of some really important ones because they're over a, a major water uh, course or they're in critical habitat for Jaguar. Um, keeping the gates open, that seems like a pretty small ask and would be very strategic for them to do to just keep those gates open. And we've listed the places where those are priorities. We've suggested a few places um, as a first round for where large wildlife openings need to happen. Um, these are places that were identified as vital places to not build wall. And they continue now to be primary targets to have big, large openings for wildlife in Cabeza Prieta and Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument. And finally, here's a list of some <clears throat> places in Coronado National Forest, Coronado National Memorial, and in Guadalupe Canyon, where we do want the patrol 
roads to be terminated. So I hope this is helpful. Um, we can work on pulling together the coordinates, the latitude and longitudes that coordinate with these, the short list of acts and have that up on our Act Now webpage. So we'll work on adding that. Okay, so we've got 15 minutes now to try to do our best to answer questions that are coming up into the chat. Um, thank you all for chiming in. I, I know that there's a lot of uh, a lot of good thoughts and questions about this and other resources that would be helpful. So let me get caught up here. Um, um, so there's a request for more information about Jaguar occurrences. So that's been in, there were newspaper reports. That's basically where, I mean, I think we've seen most of that um, information that's come out about the recent Jaguar sightings. Um, certainly, okay, there's a comment about birds and flight patterns, low flying birds, that's definitely an issue. And the lighting certainly can disrupt the migratory pathways of many species, many birds migrate at night. So the lighting's a really big issue in addition to the impacts it has on bats. Emily, there was a question about ask, requesting a quick description of vehicle barrier versus pedestrian fence. I think we showed lots of photos, but oh we sure. Yeah, well, I just put something in there. Um, I put this oh, story map ArcGIS that was done this um, last summer, and it's called the Border Wall in Arizona and New Mexico, July 2021, and um, that comes from when I mapped the border back in April, all, all the features along the border, and. Um, People have always asked, what's a pedestrian fence? What's a vehicle barrier? And this provides in detail the history of border barriers and it has example photos of all of these different things that we've been discussing. So um, if you'd like to, there's the link that's in the chat, chat and you can check that out. Yeah, thanks. Um, in fact, to the right of Emily, that is a pedestrian fence. You know, if you can hop over it or go underneath it or between it, then that would be a vehicle barrier. <laughs> yeah, so the vehicle barrier really, it's very low stature. It's maybe four feet tall. It's just cross pieces of steel that would prevent um, a car or a truck from being able to drive across the border. When they say pedestrian fence, it means what we consider a wall. Um, it can be the shorter version, like that's uh, my my screen behind me, or it can be the new 30 foot wall. Um, so it's really to prevent people from moving back back and forth across. And then somebody asked if, if you all have a list of species of concern. No, there's a lot of those. Um, I know that Center for Biological Diversity had a list that they did. A Defenders of Wildlife has done that. Uh, there's no shortage of resources that you can find. Um, obviously, we didn't include everything here because we're going over the comments. Um, and, and, and like um, I told somebody for what we presented here and the locations and, and the photos and the comments to make, it is a serving suggestion. It is not um, meaning that we identified all the best places, but they were high priority ones that uh, we've seen along the border uh, for some time that, that really continue to stand out. And so this is just the, the serving suggestion on how to do this, but, uh, provide your own information. If you have photographs, other places that are of concern to you, yeah, uh, put the put forth all of your comments. Um, we need and a we'll, lot of people to do this. Yeah, and we'll do our best as, as questions come in to add more to the Act Now page. We can mm -hmm. certainly link to some additional resources that talk about Jaguar sightings and these lists um, that other organizations have put together. So we'll try to flesh that out um, as soon as possible to make those resources available to you. Um, I'm seeing some question in there. Is it necessary to have the latitude and longitude? Look, it's better to just comment and use a place name if possible. Unfortunately, in some of these places, if you're not talking about the San Pedro River, it's a little bit difficult to identify a place name and to convey. So I guess I would say, um, ideally, we're including latitude and longitudes. However, um, if it's impossible, you can describe it um, in words. And if you have questions specifically about how to get Latin long about a particular place you want to comment on, please let us know and we can help identify those coordinates um, for you. 
So I will, um, I've seen some other comments come through. Some of them have been directly to me. I'm just, I'm, I apologize if I've skipped something <laughs> that you've asked, feel free to type it in again. Um, uh, there's a question about should comments get submitted in dif uh, different formats? So, you know, should you email a letter and uh, do the web portal through the map? And I would say it's really up to you. Instead of trying to find the Latin long, if there's a place where you want to comment on the CBP map, it's great to do it directly there if you can figure out what it is. Unfortunately, some of the places that we would love comments to be submitted about don't have one of those little pop-up windows where you can submit it directly. So I would say the most holistic method might be to create a letter, um, but if you want to do that and also go into the map, um, that would be great. That's what I plan to do myself is to do a hybrid of both. <laughs> yeah. um, I was asked a question about why aren't we identifying the large wildlife gap in the Wichuca Mountains? Um, that's not because that is not an important wildlife crossing. It's, it's in the photo behind me. It's an incredibly important place. Because of the verbal communication that we've had from DHS, um, we understand that that's larger than the gap size that they plan to fill. This is a critical spot for protecting what's open. We wanna see the patrol roads terminated and restoration to begin. But the only reason why we didn't identify it as a priority for the gap closure is we don't think it qualifies in this particular circumstance for what they're proposing. Um, there was a question I think Miles addressed about um, how, how are you addressing security concerns in the gap areas to justify that the gaps not be filled? And I think you touched on this, Miles, in terms of it not being, of that really being a false issue in so many of these places. But if you want to speak to that a little more, or Emily, either of you. Yeah, this is a, a topic that um, I know some reporters are working on now. Um, the Border Patrol reports at the sector level for all of their apprehensions. They'll say, oh, in 2021, we got 1.7 million. What they fail to say is that 1.59 million were turn-ins at the border seeking asylum. And the way that they intentionally try to uh, convey this image is that, you know, the orcs are pouring across the border and we've got to stop them at all costs, you know, um, when the reality is that they're picking up a couple people here and there. Migration has increased over the last um, probably six months. I've definitely noticed that. Uh, that's the first time in more than a decade. Um, but, you know, you could throw that back in people's faces. Well, hey, this was after Trump built this wall, and now we've got this. Uh, people are coming across, you know, kind of a false cause, cause and effect there. But, but the reality is that the border wall has stopped very little, and, um, you know, we need to get to more systemic approaches there. Um, but, you know, we're always going to encounter that question. I think it's human nature to see a gap filled in. If you built a fence in your backyard and you had like a little gap, it would just drive you up the wall to see that. So, <laughs> you know, I, I can, you got to put yourself in other people's shoes and, and, and really think about that. So I think that's a, a really good question that um, everybody on their own should figure out how, how do you approach that? How do you convince your audience that that's not the approach that we need is to fill every little gap? Um, I want to address something else that I'm seeing in the comments. So what would be concise, but in fact, well, comments that could be made to representatives in Congress or, or senators. Um, it is very clear that Department of Homeland Security has, has authorized uh, Customs and Border Protection to move ahead with this remediation plan. And it is funded. I don't know exactly which pot of funding <laughs> um, is, is going to be paying for this project, but it's in motion. I don't feel that contacting our electeds would be a successful way to affect this particular remediation, remediation plan. However, there we have some big policy asks that we would like to see the House and the Senate um, <clears throat> pass in the fiscal year 2022 appropriation bills. We very clearly want to have the mitigation funding available to begin to work on the bigger restoration projects. There's currently $150 million worth of um, mitigation funding that can be added to the Homeland Security bill if when <laughs> the budget is actually passed. So passing that particular piece of the appropriation is critical. In addition, we want the formally appropriated funding from fiscal years 2018 and 2019 
for wall construction to be reappropriated to something else. <laughs> we don't want the money that's still sitting there to build more wall. We would like to see that reappropriated. And so those are two particular asks of the House and Senate that are would be effective right now. Do you have anything else on that, Miles? No, I think that's a good answer. Um, there's a question. Oh, go ahead, Louise. I was going to say about uh, what to say about anything in particular to say about bridges. Um, they have a bridge over the Santa Cruz River, and they have a bridge over the San Pedro River now, and Silver Creek and Black Traw. Um, you know, there's, there's really not an issue with bridges. Uh, in fact, at the Santa Cruz River, it used to be that the road went through the, the river. Uh, so in terms of, you know, water quality for native fishes, uh, you know, roadkill, um, I could argue that the, the bridge that they built um, probably protects aquatic resources better than no bridge at all. But what we don't want to happen is that bridge to become a walled off border wall like the San Pedro River, like uh, the, the refuge. Um, we'd, we would like to see it remain what is currently in place at the Santa Cruz River, uh, south of Kino Springs, to where that wall is um, quite wildlife friendly right now. So if we can move towards that, that would be good. Um, there's, a, I think, a comment about the Roosevelt Reservation and that nothing was supposed to be built outside of it. There's definitely places along the border where the construction did wildly go beyond the uh, Roosevelt Reservation. The current remediation plan does um, describe reseeding in places where that happened. And that's the primary mitigation activity that I saw in the plan related to crossing over that Roosevelt Reservation. Mm -hmm. Do you have any comments about additional thoughts about that? Miles? Well, um, you know, they, they talk about reseeding a lot. And this is important because already I'm seeing buffalo grass and layman lovegrass and other exotics popping up in places where they weren't before. And this is definitely a result of heavy equipment and tires and everything moving around and then disturbing the soil. Whoever does this reseeding work uh, needs to be local and they need to uh, do this correctly, not just a highway generic, you know, soil stabilization source because uh, reseeding projects can often result in bringing in a lot of weeds and other exotics because the nature that they harvest a lot of these places, they do it in highly productive uh, places like Texas where you, so you may get, you know, an expansion of species that weren't present here. So, um, and this, this also is important for your comments is when you provide a comment and say, we need to reseed the, um, these disturbed areas, it's good to provide some justification. So follow that up, a comment like that with, um, you know, ranchers along the border rely on native grasslands for, you know, their economic well-being and conversion of grassland to exotic species such as layman lovegrass and buffalo grass uh, could result in, you know, loss of revenue for them or it could result in community conversion because now you have an exotic grassland um, converting native grasslands and all their associated species into, you know, less productive system, less robust biodiverse system. So, you know, provide, you know, justifications, you know, cause and effect whenever you can. So we're, we're getting down to the end of time here, Miles, and maybe just if we could do one more, um, could you comment on where the well lighting is currently in place and being used if we note that? It's not being used anywhere. Um, it was almost complete in the San Bernardino Valley, all of the infrastructure, but they have not hooked the, um, the lighting up yet. Um, I, I heard that the extension cord was on back order. They couldn't get it, but, um, but no, seriously, they, um, fortunately they did not turn that on because um, as a lot of people know from the study done this last year that the San Bernardino Valley had the, one of the highest 
numbers of pollinators um, of any place in North America. It was in like the top three. So, um, you know, the effect on birds and bats and insects and nocturnal species would be severe if they turned on this lighting. If you want an example of that, if you went over to Columbus Palomas over in New Mexico, they've had lighting going about uh, a mile and a half each direction from the town. And um, you can actually see that lighting if you are on approach into Albuquerque, sitting on the left side of the plane from the east at nighttime, that's over 150 miles away. So the effects of lighting can go a super long ways. So we've got to make sure that they do not turn on any of this lighting or proceed forth with um, finishing the infrastructure that was starting in a lot of other places. Okay, well, thank you for that, Miles. We're, we're getting to the end of time here, and I want to just close this out. If we get more resources and are able to add more, it will go onto our Act Now page. As we understand it, all of the comments, they need to be in by February 3rd into CBP. CBP then will be reviewing this, how they're going to, if they're going to uh, make changes to the remediation plan, we don't know, but it is likely within the next 90 days. RFPs for contractors will go out um, and contractors will be able to bid on this work. It's expected that after that hiring process happens, that construction, these re, um, remediation strategies could begin in this calendar year. So we're probably looking at six months-ish plus before we start seeing activities on the ground. But again, often we don't know these things are going to happen until we see the construction crews out there. <laughs> So um, we're kind of leading the, we're leading in our area with the Tucson sector. We've heard that the next plans are coming. I think it might be um, the Texas plan that's coming next. Um, so more on that when we know about it, but so far we found out on January 4th with everyone else that the remediation plan for the Tucson sector was here. <laughs> so um, thank you for, for joining this discussion today. Um, and please um, follow our social media channels, our email newsletters, and our website for more information. We'll share it as we get it.